Making movies in Hollywood seems simple enough. You go through years and years of auditions until you finally land that dream role that you wanted, only for it to turn into a real nightmare. Whether it be unsafe set locations, malpractice from crew members, or just dangerous stunts that were too bold for their time. Today, we are going over some more horrible film accidents. Now, as a little challenge, let's see if you guys can get this video to 15k likes. Seeing as the other one is already at that, that should be pretty easy. If you haven't seen part one, go ahead and just keep watching this one. It doesn't matter which order you watch them in. There's no continuity besides just crazy onset accidents. The way in which I ordered all of these incidents in today's video was by majority vote, meaning that I put what everyone wanted to hear me talk about first. And with that, Let's get onto our first film accident. Everyone should know about The Twilight Zone. It's the famous show with Rod Sterling that features tales of science fiction, fantasy, and humanity in ways that would end in either surprise twists or some kind of lesson. The modern day equivalent is Black Mirror, minus the timelessness that the original Twilight Zone shares. It was quite popular in the 1960s when it originally aired. So it was a no-brainer for executives and everyone around Hollywood during this time to push for a Twilight Zone movie. And that's exactly what happened. Steven Spielberg was drafted to produce the film along with the more infamous person in the story, John Landis, who by the end of this segment, you should see as a very heinous individual. The film was set to stay true to the source material, opting to have a few stories from the original series recreated into the movie. Because after all, The Twilight Zone is an anthology series, so it didn't really make for the easiest transition to film. They solved the issue by making the movie into four separate segments, effectively making it into an anthology film. The four segments were reimaginings of four separate episodes that were recreated and repurposed into the Twilight Zone movie. Those episodes were Kick the Can, It's a Good Life, Nightmare at 20,000 Feet, and the segment that is the reason this movie is on this list, which is the first segment titled Time Out. This one takes elements from two episodes of the original series, A Quality of Mercy, and another one titled Back There. Vic Morrow plays a racist man who, through his continued bigotry, gets sent back in time to Nazi Germany. This allows him to feel the effects of racism, only he is the victim now. During the filming of this, there was to be a climactic sequence towards the end that involved a helicopter, Vic Morrow, and two children named Micah Din Lee and Renee Shinyi Chen. The original scene of the movie was going to feature Vic Morrow saving these two Vietnamese children from oncoming fire. The ending would feature a fully functioning war helicopter that would fly extremely close to the actors. The entire plan was to have the helicopter fly towards a patch of land at the end of this river. Then Vic Morrow with the kids in his arms would carry each one to the other end of the river. Then the scene would climactically end with rockets being sent out as the trio got into the helicopter and out of harm's way. It was a pretty ambitious stunt to have in your film and it was even more dangerous to even attempt filming it. So dangerous in fact that many crew members from pilots to members of the production team were fighting for the scene to be seized from filming or at the very least tamed the hell down. John Landis who was the director for this segment showed zero remorse for not only just Vic Morrow but also the children, repeatedly asking the pilots to fly the helicopter even closer to the actors. It was his arrogance for wanting to make what he thought would be an amazing piece of film that cost the life of not just Vic Morrow but also the two child actors. When the shot was put into action, everything was proceeding as planned. The helicopter got extremely close to the actors, turning in the air to make its landing when an accidental explosive went off. A mortar was fired way too early, causing it to hit the tail end of the helicopter and completely rip it off. This obviously caused the helicopter to crash into the water below, with the helicopter blades killing Vic Morrow and Michael Lee, with the body of the helicopter causing Renee Chen to pass as well. Just like, it's just a horrible, horrible accident that could have easily been prevented. You know, just to really push how much of an evil person John Landis really was, 
they weren't even legally allowed to use the children in the shot. At the time of filming, the laws surrounding child actors were pretty strict, especially with time constraints, transparency, and curfews. So to circumvent the issue, John Landis hired two child actors as extras, which allowed him to keep them on set longer than he should have been able to. He also chose, at least from what I've read online, chose to not disclose the dangerous nature of the stunt with the parents until the day of filming. And what's really horrible about this is the fact that the mother of Renee Chen was on set watching this entire stunt go down. I don't even know how to react to that. Like, I'm not even a parent of anyone, but just put yourself in their shoes. I can't even imagine how horrible it must feel to see that happen. And there's nothing you could do as the parent but watch. And of course, it ended up going to court because there was a pretty good case to make for negligence on part of the director and also some people on the crew. And it's rumored that during the court hearing, John Landis pulled yet another grimy move. Now, this is just rumored. I don't know if this is actually confirmed or not. From what I've read online through some articles, it does appear to be the truth, but I'm not going to say that set in stone. So basically what John Landis started doing during these court hearings was when they were on break, he would tell people about him making a movie about the trial that they were on, inciting that he might even want the actual jury to be played in the movie as themselves. And in doing so, it was in the jury's best interest to let John Landis free because if John Landis was in jail, how would they get their big break and be able to be in the movie? Again, I don't know if that's the case or not, but what ended up happening is he was acquitted of all charges. Now, regardless of why he was acquitted in the first place, it is absolutely this guy's fault that this even happened. There's just way too many accounts of witnesses that show that people definitely expressed concern over the sequence in the movie, and he just went on his merry way with it anyways. And honestly, the worst part of this entire thing is the fact that this guy went on to live a pretty normal life, making movies after the fact, and he's shown zero guilt for what he did. Because yes, you caused this dude. I don't know if somehow this guy will end up watching this video, but you are the problem. You caused those three people to die. This guy is just pure evil. There's so many interviews on the internet where it's incredibly clear that this guy just does not care about what happened. I wanted to remind everyone and make it clear that this was a preventable accident. And I think most of the people that were defendants in this case should have been put in jail for their carelessness. From the pilot who succumbed to the peer pressure of filming the entire stunt, allowing the director to force him into doing it, to the director John Landis, who repeatedly ignored everyone's pleas and cries to not go through with filming this scene and did it anyways. John Landis refuses to accept the reality of the situation, which is that he got three people killed, instead choosing to live inside of an echo chamber where he legitimately believes that he's a great guy. I'm going to leave you with a quote from John Landis, and I'll leave a link below to this one because I doubt that any of you will actually believe that this guy said this. Now, I'm just going to read this directly off what I wrote because I don't want to get any details wrong. Now, John Landis attended Vic Morrow's memorial service a few days after the incident happened, and it was here that he delivered the most egotistical, disgustingly arrogant quote to the people at the memorial service. He said, and I quote, tragedy can strike in an instant, but film is immortal. Vic lives on forever. Just before the last take, Vic took me aside to thank me for the opportunity to play this role. So while people are mourning over the death of this amazing actor, this dude is trying to sell the idea that what he did is not that bad. And in fact, people should be thanking him for allowing this guy to get the role. How self-righteous, egotistical, and narcissistic do you have to be to think what you did was right and also go drive to a memorial service that you shouldn't even be at and on top of that deliver that line? Screw this guy. Like honestly, like John Landis, if you're out there, dude, like screw you, dude. I don't understand how, how I have no idea how this guy managed to get away with this because it's just insane that this this entire set even happened and then he got away with it 
he actually got away with it. To end on somewhat of a positive note, this movie did impact the way that we film movies today. I'm pretty sure that there's a lot more provisions specifically involving flying vehicles and helicopters in movies as well as child labor laws because you shouldn't be able to get around that by just hiring kids as extras. So there is somewhat of a positive light for this one, but honestly, screw John Landis, man. On the set of Passion of the Christ, lead actor Jim Caviezel took quite the beating over the course of shooting that movie. The first incident we're going to talk about wasn't really an accident, it was more just pure chance that it occurred. During the filming of the Sermon on the Mount scene, actor Jim Caviezel was struck by lightning. He describes the moment as there being a fire on either side of his head even having an out-of-body experience due to the incident being so sudden. Now that was pretty much sheer bad luck. There wasn't really an accident that could have been prevented there, but the same cannot be said for what happened during the rest of the filming. During the flogging scene where Jesus is whipped repeatedly, Jim was struck by one of the whips and mostly because of bad training and also bad planning. To set up this stunt, they had a metal plate that was placed right behind Jim Caviezel's back, so that, in hindsight, if anyone tried to hit Jim Caviezel on the back, it would hit the metal plate instead. But of course, that's not what ended up happening. I believe the reason this went wrong was because the actors were instructed to get a running start almost like a baseball pitcher would, and then they would fling their whips almost like they're throwing a baseball. But in doing so, one of the whips actually whipped around the metal plate and ripped a 14-inch gash into Jim Caviezel's side. If that wasn't bad enough, during the crucifixion scene, which is one of the most iconic parts of that movie, it's said that Caviezel dislocated his shoulder not just once, but several times during the filming of this scene. Most of this injury occurred when they were filming the scene in which Jim Caviezel is carrying the wooden crucifix. You have to keep in mind that he is really carrying this. Jim Caviezel on screen is really the person that is holding this wooden crucifix up, and it's over 150 pounds. So it's no wonder that he dislocated his shoulders several times while shooting this specific sequence. But it's moments like this where Jesus is slammed into the ground that also resulted in a dislocated shoulder. And none of this even compares to when he was posted up on the mountain. He was really propped up on top of the mountain and the crucifix was posted in the ground. Due to crazy weather conditions and the way that he was being propped up and hung, he suffered pneumonia during the filming of this part. For those that are unaware, when you are hung on a cross like this, you will begin to suffer from asphyxiation, which is just fancy talk for suffocating to death. I wasn't able to find any information on how Jim Caviezel was hung in this fashion, but he really did deal with these issues that come with being hung on the cross. And even after telling you all that, there wasn't even a guarantee that this stunt was safe. This is because the way in which they put the post in the ground led to the cross repeatedly swaying from side to side. And they were on top of a mountain, so if the cross were to come out of the ground and fall, Jim Caviezel most likely would have ended up dead. That's crazy because you'd think at the very least doing a dangerous stunt like this, whatever they could control, which was posting the crucifix in the ground safely would be done correctly, but it wasn't. So during the filming, during the initial filming, when they first filmed the crucifixion scene, Mel Gibson actually saw the cross swaying from side to side and he made Jim Caviezel get up on the crucifix again and they filmed for over five weeks because the first take that they had wasn't good enough. He forced Jim to do this because Mel thought it would take away from the climax of the movie, which is this sequence he wanted Jesus to be in the main frame and not the cross. So he forced him to do another five weeks of shooting just to get the perfect shot. And that's gonna be a running theme with a lot of these. You've already seen it in part one and for the first item on today's video, a lot of directors are just going through these amazing lengths to get the so-called perfect shot when they aren't the ones that are gonna be at risk. Overall, it's just crazy how much Jim Caviezel endured just to make the film, but I wouldn't feel too bad for the guy because he seems to have taken it with a grain of salt. Having done multiple interviews explaining how the entire experience made him grow closer to his Christian faith. On the set of the movie The Crow, actor Brandon Lee was shot with a gun firing supposedly a blank, but when he fell down and never got back up, it became increasingly clear that that's not really what happened. 
The way this went down was when the actor shot the blank at Brandon Lee, he fell down and went through with the entire scene. Only the crew didn't realize he wasn't acting until it was time to reshoot and they noticed he wasn't getting back up. The reason Brandon wasn't getting back up was because he actually did take a shot to the chest. But this wasn't because there was a real bullet inside of the gun. This is because there was an obstruction that was inside of the barrel of the gun. So when they shot the blank, it shot that out instead. The first thought that might come to your head when you hear this is how did the obstruction get there? So a few weeks prior, they used a dummy bullet in the gun, which is essentially just a real bullet with the gunpowder removed. These are used on set quite frequently to get viewers to believe that they are shooting real guns that are actually loaded. It adds to the overall realism. So before the scene with Brandon Lee was shot, they used the same gun that was shot weeks prior with that dummy bullet inside. And because someone either forgot to check or just didn't think about it at the time, when they used that same gun, there was actually a piece of metal from the dummy round stuck inside of the barrel. That little metal piece, to my knowledge, is known as a primer cap. This end of the bullet, this you know, tiny little metal circle, when the bullet is shot dry, it still has enough power to lodge that tiny circle into the gun, resulting in an obstruction. This is easily noticeable if you took the opportunity to check the gun. If you open the gun up and look down the barrel, you will notice no light coming through. And if you simply check the barrel from the other end, you will clearly see it lodged in there. Unfortunately, no one did this on the set of The Crow, so when Brandon Lee's character was shot using a blank, he fired that little primer cap directly at him with the same speed of a bullet, causing him to pass away. What's really sad about this entire situation is most people tried spinning the story into a conspiracy about how the mafia killed Bruce Lee and how they staged this movie in order to kill his son, Brandon Lee, but none of that is really what happened. It's just another incident where poor safety precautions or safety precautions just not being followed are what resulted in yet another horrible film accident. You might be shocked to find out that one of the worst injuries sustained on a film set happened in one of the most popular fantasy series. During the making of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, there was a sequence with Harry and Voldemort that would result in Harry flying backwards. I imagine it was due to a spell or an explosion of some sorts. There isn't really any details behind the sequence, but we know it was a sequence involving Harry and Voldemort because the stunt double that was going to be in the scene has explained that. The basic point you need to know before explaining the stunt is there is an industry standard stunt or what I think to be an industry standard stunt called a jerk back. A jerk back involves the stunt performer being thrown back, usually after an explosion, falling onto some kind of safety mat on the ground. The scene with Harry and Voldemort was going to involve a jerk back. So Daniel Radcliffe's stunt double, David Holmes, was gearing up for the stunt and before shooting it, they decided that they would rehearse it. During this rehearsal for the stunt is where the accident happened. When they went through with it and David was flown into the air, as the stunt happened, David was thrown a lot further back than he anticipated, so much so that he hit the wall directly behind him, slamming his back into it and then falling onto the mat in front of him. Hearing this might not shock you because we've gone over other horrible accidents like in part one, the Back to the Future incident, a lady literally fell 30 feet onto concrete but David ended up paralyzed from this incident and he was paralyzed for the foreseeable future. It's really unfortunate that this happened, not just because being paralyzed is a horrible thing that can occur, but the fact that David had a really, really good history as a stunt performer. He spent many, many years working his way up the Hollywood ladder, being Harry's stunt double from the very first movie up until the last movie, only for this accident to basically shift his life into a completely different direction. Now I put this one on today's video because this ends up being a very heartwarming and inspiring story. Despite the mental toll that this would take on literally anybody, David Holmes has taken it with such an amazing attitude and I would say that this guy is currently living his best life. I believe he's still friends with Daniel Radcliffe as they have worked together for many years, having even done a podcast called Cunning Stunts where David Holmes, with the sometimes help of guest host Daniel Radcliffe, talk to various stunt performers and have them talk about their most dangerous stunts and the aftermath. David has one of the most 
positive attitudes regarding the situation that I just don't think many people would. You honestly gotta respect him for it. He, he even still does death-defying adrenaline pumping experiences, having a specially modified car that allows him to do his race driving. Driving on racetracks at speeds up to 150 miles per hour. I mean, to go from this crazy accident to still doing what he loves and even trying to spin his turmoil into a podcast for us to enjoy, I just don't see how you can't love that. And I wanted to end today's video off with that because a lot of my channel is going over really horrible stuff that happens on the internet. And I just wanted to show people that no matter what happens, you can always, you know, if you're able to get back up and try, you can always do that. And you can always make your life better than it was before, even if it might not seem like that to other people. So hopefully that ended today's video off on a high note. And with that said, we are at the end of today's video. Again, I will make a part three. Just hit the like button. Only 15K likes. That should be pretty easy. I feel like that's pretty easy. All right. If everyone watching right now liked this video, that's pretty easy. But anyways, uh, I just wanted to really quickly say thanks to everyone because um, I just life's been great. <laughs> I took like a week off last week and I started making this video uh, this week. But I just wanted to say thanks because life's been great. And, and I really can't summarize it other than that. I've been doing stuff that I love, uh, making videos, uh, going to tournaments, uh, just enjoying my life right now. And yeah, it's crazy that I'm able to do this. Um, a little sneak peek. I, I finally got um, equipment to make my Jack Stauber video. I have my VCR and my CRT TV to recreate some cool Jack Stauber effects when that comes out. So I am working on that. I want people to know that I am working on that. But yeah, I just wanted to give a huge thanks before we do the patron shout out which is what I'm going to talk about right now. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone that has subscribed to the Patreon. Honestly, if you are one of these people on screen or if you're one of the second tier people or the first tier people, like, thank you so, 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 so much. We've like nearly doubled or tripled the Patreon from like when I first released it. And I just wanted to say thanks. And there is going to be more cool stuff coming to the Patreon. Uh, the sticker promotion did end on April 30th. But I will have something else coming up during June, which is my birthday month. <laughs> so I just wanted to give a humongous thanks to everyone that has joined the Patreon. Really, like, you all make this worthwhile. <laughs> you make me able to do this. So I just wanted to give a huge thanks. And yeah, I really don't think I have anything else to say besides that. So with all that said, I will see you all in the next video. Thanks for watching.